All right, modification of airway resistance. Um, here we're talking about dealing with bronchoconstriction. And <coughs> uh, you'd think that bronchoconstriction would occur anytime there's inflammation in the lung. And that's probably true to some degree. But uh, bronchodilators have not typically helped that much in pneumonias and things of that sort. You can use them, but the evidence doesn't really support it. Primarily, we see it uh, in uh, acute allergic reactions. Uh, and then we're talking about feline asthma and feline, or excuse me, equine COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. Uh, now, both of those latter realize are diseases of expiration, all right, not inhalation. Uh, I'm sure they'll teach you all about the differences uh, in this when you, uh, Dr. Swiderski has you if um, they haven't already. But it's an inability to expire. You think about a narrowed airway. When you inhale, your chest goes out and it opens that airway. So you can inhale just fine. But when they go to exhale, that airway collapses. And so they're not able to force out a full tidal volume. Part of that inhaled air is trapped in the alveolus. And then <coughs> that pressure on the air that can't escape causes bulli and the various uh, damages we see associated with asthma and COPD, COPD being the more severe form. That involves other things other than just bronchoconstriction. So those two are um, exhalation uh, problems. And the rationale for using a bronchodilator is that resistance to airflow is proportional to the radius of the airway raised to the fourth power. So that means that very small changes in airway diameter have a tremendous benefit in decreasing resistance. Okay, so you don't have to change the airway diameter much to improve airflow. And we have three categories of bronchodilators to choose from. Adrenergic agonists, anticholinergics, and methylxanthines. Okay. Uh, now for uh, the adrenergic agonists, um, we've got three adrenergic receptors, remember, beta-1, beta-2, and alpha-1. All right, alpha stimulation has a pressure effect on blood pressure. Now, we don't really want that in straight bronchoconstriction, but in anaphylaxis, it's a good thing. Uh, and it also decreases respiratory secretions and shrinks swollen mucous membranes. Remember, uh, I talked about in the autonomic system, whenever you hear the word decongestant, that's actually a vasoconstrictor that's uh, constricting the blood vessels and the mucosa to uh, minimize swollen uh, passages. Beta-1 activity increases heart rate uh, and conduction. Uh, may benefit if cardiac output is an issue. Again, this is more incidental. It's the beta-2s that we're after. Beta-2s are selectively bronchodilatory, but they have other things as well. Some of them inhibit mast cell degranulation, so they may have a little bit of an anti-inflammatory effect. All right, so we want beta twos. Um, epinephrine has a role in bronchodilation in human medicine. Uh, if you go into an ER with a severe acute asthmatic attack, they'll probably give you sub-Q epinephrine. Uh, yeah, they might not, but that's still commonly done, and, and uh, it's all those benefits. It shrinks swollen uh, mucous membranes, swollen larynx, these sorts of things from the alpha-1, and it bronchodilates from the beta-2. We don't really like the beta-1 stimulation, except in the case of asystole. Uh, and again, that's probably where you're going to use epinephrine the most, is either in cardiac arrest due to asystole or anaphylaxis. <coughs> now, uh, there are mixed beta adrenergics, no alpha effect, but beta-1 and beta-2. All right, uh, so no alpha stimulation. Isoterenol, isoprel uh, is the prototype here. 
it's bronchodilatory and it stimulates heart rate. This tachycardia limits our usefulness, all right, from a treatment standpoint. But it can be used as a challenge test in uh, equine COPD. I'll explain this a little bit more with another uh, challenge test uh, using atropine. All right, but I'll, I'll show you kind of how this isoterenol works here. I mentioned uh, this was from my dissertation. In addition to looking at the pharmacokinetics of theophylline in cattle, I did respiratory function testing. This is Luther. Luther was one of my favorites. Uh, you can imagine it took a while to get a steer to stand still long enough to do respiratory function testing on them, but uh, we managed and I made this face mask and all that was kind of interesting. I, I actually did a death mask of a steer plaster molding and then I made the mask around that and it was a very involved process. Anyway, all this is homemade. But uh, you're looking here, this is uh, pulmonary resistance and this is compliance. Compliance, pulmonary compliance is kind of the inverse of resistance. Resistance is self-explanatory. Uh, <clears throat> uh, compliance refers to the stiffness of the lung, how easy it is to inflate. So you want a very compliant lung. And so I, I needed to test this apparatus to see if it worked with the Offlin, so I used isoproterenol. And so the baseline heart rate was 46, and I gave IV isoproterenol. You can see the heart rate increasing. Actually, we try to double the heart rate. This is uh, a valid challenge test. We give isoproterenol, kind of titrate it until we double the heart rate. I kind of overshoot here. But you can see the drop in resistance and the improvement in compliance is pretty significant. All right. <clears throat> so uh, that's an isoproterenol challenge test uh, for asthma, for COPD. As I said, I'll explain it a little bit better in the uh, anticholinergics. Mostly, though, we're shooting for selective beta 2 bronchodilators. All right. We get the benefit without the other problems. All right. And we have three main ones in veterinary medicine. In small animals, and also actually in horses, this is available out there in horses as well, using the pediatric spacer, we have albuterol. Salbuterol is a, uh, the same thing as albuterol, if you see that name, salbuterol. Uh, <coughs> but uh, this is puffed into the pediatric spacer and inhaled for a local effect. That's ideally how we do it, because we get away from systemic side effects. But um, we have clenbuterol, which is approved as an oral syrup in horses for COPD. And it is the main bronchodilator used in human medicine. Okay. Now, uh, in small animals, if they're not responding to the puffer, we can use terbutaline as an injection. All right. So it's a selective beta-2 injection. So the first and the last or more small animal, the clenbuterol is primarily uh, horses. Now, uh, you can see side effects. The least you're going to obviously see is when you use an inhaled beta-2. Relatively few side effects if it works, works really well. We're more likely to see it especially with terbutaline and that's because terbutaline is the least beta-2 selective uh, selectivity, relatively speaking. It does spill over to beta-1 a little bit. So especially with higher doses or the individual susceptible animal, you can see some tachycardia. Also, some muscle tremors from the beta-2 effects can sometimes occur. So those are your two primary problems with beta-2s, but normally they're pretty well tolerated. We don't, you can see these, this is why I'm telling you about them, but the majority of animals don't have any side effects from it. And just while we're on the subject, going back to the autonomic nervous system, these same agents are used as tocolytics in human medicine. Tocolytic means to lyse the birth process, so it stops uterine activity and prevents uh, premature births in humans. Uh, <clears throat> and then we have the methylxanthines. This is a group. Uh, you don't have to know the mechanism of action because we're not sure. 
Uh, we used to say it inhibited phosphodiesterase leading to an increase in cyclic AMP which relaxed the bronchi and we got beta 2. Uh, some thought is it's an adenosine antagonist. You're probably not that familiar with adenosine but adenosine is a naturally occurring compound that in certain disease states um, uh, can be a problem and in human uh, asthma and COPD is thought that it may be part of the bronchoconstrictive pathway and uh, the methylxanthines block that. Regardless, we do get a bronchodilation, but I can tell you from those studies I did in calves, it's not prominent, not like a beta-2 is. Beta-2s, in my experience and based on my research, are much better bronchodilators than uh, the methylxanthines are. I found the methylxanthines work well to inhibit bronchodilation prior, if I pretreated before a challenge, then they block the bronchoconstriction. But they were less effective at reversing an ongoing bronchoconstriction. All right. So I rely more on beta 2s in the acute scenario, and I'll use the methylxanthines, theophylline, uh, on a long-term basis if it's appropriate based on species. But they think that a lot of the benefit, <clears throat> and this is important, is that uh, these increase the strength of respiratory muscle, including the diaphragm. So where I really like these uh, is in respiratory fatigue. All right, <clears throat> and you probably haven't seen this, hopefully you haven't, but you will. You get some diseases, particularly some of the pneumonias, where they are just working so, so hard to breathe. They're, they're fighting for their breath, all right? And this goes on for hours, days, and some of them just finally give up. They're just absolutely exhausted, and they go into a respiratory arrest, and then they die. So in these respiratory fatigues is where I'm most likely to use this class of drug, okay? As I mentioned, it may vasodilate the pulmonary vasculature. It may inhibit uh, mast cell degranulation. Actually has a positive inotropic effect, all right? But mainly it's these two things. And from my standpoint, it's this effect on skeletal muscle that I think is the primary benefit. Now, uh, what is one of the methylxanthines? Caffeine. All right, so you see CNS stimulation from these as a side effect. All right, and these are the three methylxanthines. You know, caffeine from coffee, you're no dose. You're, you're probably very familiar with it, all right, prior to test time. Theobromine is what's in chocolate, okay. And you talk about chocolate toxicity, uh, that's the active component there, okay. Uh, theophylline has a little better therapeutic index. Uh, so this is the main methylxanthine that we use uh, as a drug, uh, theophylline. I always like it when I pick up tidbits uh, from TV shows. I say, yeah, they got that right. Uh, <laughs> You probably don't remember, there was a show called Quantum Leap, uh, and it was a guy who time traveled and assumed other people's bodies. Anyway, he was a physician and everything. I remember this one show, they were driving along in this truck, and his, his, the, the passenger had an acute asthma attack. So he got him out and gave him several cups of coffee. And that could actually work. <laughs> It really could. So I was going, yeah, that, that makes sense. All right. But normally we use theophylline. All right. Now, theophylline comes uh, as a, a, a solid dosage form, either in a regular release or sustained release uh, uh, tablet. The sustained release have been hard to find lately, but they cut down on the frequency. Typically, Regular release is a TID administration where the sustained release we can get by with BID. Now people get confused with aminophilin. Aminophilin is theophylin. It's just a water-soluble salt of theophylin. All right, it's about 81% theophylin. So it's mainly, we use it as the injectable form of theophylin given IV. 
it's available as a tablet, but it doesn't have a lot of benefit over the, the Theophylline tablet. Can be given IM, but it's pretty painful, so no one does this. Uh, we use it IV in the acute situation, but more commonly we use Theophylline orally for uh, prolonged effects. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, this is one of those drugs that has a low therapeutic index, and that's another reason uh, I use beta-2s more commonly. Uh, you know the CNS stimulation, it wakes you up, but in the more severe overdose cases, you can actually see seizures associated with it. Also, uh, cardiac arrhythmias can be a problem. They start out as atrial supraventricular arrhythmias, but they can progress into ventricular arrhythmias. Probably um, most animals that die of a methylxanthine overdose, uh, like um, chocolate, and chocolate, when you get down in clinics, or maybe Dr. Gaunt will talk to you, uh, it depends on what chocolate is to how much theobromine they have. Milk chocolate has relatively little. They have to eat a ton of milk chocolate. They'll probably get pancreatitis or an upset stomach before they get a theobromine toxicity with milk chocolate. But baker, Baker's chocolate, dark chocolate, uh, those are more problematic. But probably in veterinary medicine, they die more from ventricular arrhythmias. In human medicine, seizures are really common. I uh, um, can't really recall a seizure, uh, though it certainly could. Now, in the dog, uh, vomiting is a common sign. So if they have ingested enough to cause toxicity, they vomit. Uh, that may be a good thing in getting rid of what's left, but it's a bad thing in terms of prognosis because that means they took a pretty high dose. So you need to address this. Now here's the, the, the drawback. From my standpoint, <clears throat> if you're going to use uh, Theophylline long term, you need therapeutic drug monitoring. Not short term. I've got that animal in ICU in the, in the oxygen cage. I'll give him an uh, IV dose of aminophilin because uh, he's uh, in respiratory fatigue, and I may follow that with one or two doses. But <clears throat> longer term, where you're trying to manage the horse with COPD in their own long term, theophylline or the feline asthma uh, scenario, there you really ought to do therapeutic drug monitoring. And you don't have to know these numbers, this just makes a point. The minimum effective concentration is thought to be about 10 micrograms per mil. Maximum non-toxic concentration varies by species. 20 uh, is uh, the upper limit in um, man. People use it in dogs, but work actually uh, indicates that uh, they're more tolerant, will uh, uh, tolerate about 35. The horse, less tolerant, uh, they only tolerate at 15. So in the horse, you're trying to keep them between 10 and 15. Uh, which sounds hard, but luckily horses have the longest half-life, so it is, is doable. So just know that there are species differences in your target concentrations and tolerance to theophylline. <clears throat> now the reason, uh, part of the reason we have to do therapeutic drug monitoring is drug interactions, uh, but also disease. Uh, as a spinoff from uh, what I did I showed that the Theophylline was absorbed well orally in cattle and did have a beneficial effect on bronchoconstriction, so we moved it into a clinical trial treating cattle with pneumonia. And of course we hoped that it would improve morbidity and mortality. What we found was the actual opposite. More cattle died that got the Theophylline than lived. And <coughs> When we checked their blood samples, these all had very high toxic levels of theophylline. And so we got to digging around and we found that interferon increases the half-life of theophylline. So I've gotten where I will not use theophylline more than one or two doses in a pneumonia unless I'm doing therapeutic drug monitoring. Okay. Now, drug interactions, you've got several. Probably the, the, <coughs> the first three are the biggies. Uh, phenobarb, if they're on that for epilepsy, uh, that's going to decrease your half-life. 
and tend to make it subtherapeutic. But the biggies, uh, cimetidine as a histamine acid suppressor, increases the half-life, which is one reason we don't use cimetidine much anymore. We use famotidine instead because famotidine doesn't have this as an H2 blocker. The one I really want you to know, though, are the fluoroquinolones, all right? <coughs> fluoroquinolones can easily cause a theophylline toxicity. You have that cat uh, that is on theophylline for asthma and he gets a bronchitis on top of it and you add a fluoroquinolone to treat the bronchitis and all of a sudden you're dealing with a cat uh, with theophylline toxicity. He's wired, he's tachycardic, these sorts of things. So <coughs> when we're going to use uh, fluoroquinolone like Batril or Marbo uh, <coughs> uh, and their own theophylline, we decrease our theophylline dose about a third to a half, all right? And if it's going, if we really need to make sure we do therapeutic drug monitoring. But that's a big drug interaction you need to know. Okay, so bronchodilators, again, primarily used in feline asthma and equine COPD. We will use them in other diseases, uh, bronchitis, pneumonia, but their effectiveness in those is somewhat circumspect. Uh, definitely in bronchoconstricted diseases, they help. And definitely, in my view, the beta-2 agonists are the best bronchodilators, okay? We primarily use the inhaled uh, products in small animals and increasingly in horses where it's given by a face mask with a spacer. Uh, though we certainly have injectable products uh, if we want a more rapid onset or they don't respond. So that's one way we can bronchodilate. Another way is we can use anticholinergics. Uh, muscarinic receptors bronchoconstrict, so if you add an uh, anti-muscarinic or muscarinic blocker, then you get bronchodilation. And that does, in fact, occur. Unfortunately, we see a variety of other side effects. Uh, we get tachycardia, uh, decrease in respiratory secretions with increased viscosity, uh, cycloplegia and midriasis, the pupils dilate, and we slow GI motility, okay? Uh, so these are the typical atropine glycopyrrolate. I'll add buscopan, I'll show you on the next slide. <coughs> and largely, these have too many side effects to be used routinely. Now, Spireva is one, it's an inhaler for human medicine that is an anticholinergic but uh, it hasn't been used, to my knowledge, in, uh, in veterinary medicine. So yes, they work, and you can use them in an emergency if you don't have uh, a beta-2 available to you, but they have a lot of side effects. So largely, we don't use them to actually uh, treat ongoing bronchoconstriction as a disease. Where they have a niche role, though, is in diagnostic testing. Okay, and uh, atropine is used in this, and I just added this. I got to thinking about 20 minutes ago, I said, hmm, I wonder if buscopan is used in this. And so I looked it up and I found one paper in a proceedings that mentioned it. So I'm going to follow up and see how common this is. But buscopan is butylscopolamine. It's a muscarinic uh, antagonist like atropine, but it tends to have fewer side effects is actually approved in horses for spasmodic colic. So it might work in that regard. Now what we're doing, um, <clears throat> uh, this is used in equine COPD and this is a bronchoconstrictive obstructive disease but also you tend to get a lot of fibrosis in the lung and stiffening, especially the longer uh, the disease lasts, the more inflammatory changes in fibrosis you get. So uh, some horses uh, have a diminished ability to respond to bronchodilators. The receptors are stimulated, but the lung is so stiff, it's so non-compliant, you don't really get much bronchodilation. 
So in that case, you're kind of wasting bronchodilators and risking their side effects <coughs> uh, in these horses. So we will use a challenge test uh, to see if we can bronchodilate them in the face of their natural disease. All right. Now you recall the little slide I showed you with the, uh, the steer. I had the face mask on and doing the respiratory function testing. I used isoproterenol on that steer and you saw the dramatic drop in pulmonary resistance. That's an isoproterenol challenge test. All right. And it has been done in COPD. The problem is uh, not with the test. Isoproterenol, remember, is a beta-1 and beta-2 agonist. So the way we use it in the challenge test, like with that steer, is you give it IV and the beta-1 stimulates the heart rate, so we approximately try to double the heart rate. And when that's double, we figure we have enough beta-2 stimulation to assess the patient. But uh, we normally don't want the tachycardia in every other situation. So the bottom line is not many people keep isoproterin all around, but they have atropine all the time. All right, so we can do this. And what you're doing is you're giving a test dose of atropine IV to see if it improves the respiratory effort. All right, and this diminishes the heave line. And you can see the heave line here. Um, uh, <clears throat> if you've not had this, I'll just reinforce it even if you have. COPD again and asthma are expiratory diseases. They can't get the air out of their lungs. The bronchoconstriction is collapsing the airway and so <coughs> uh, air is trapped in the lung. And therefore on the next breath they can't inhale an adequate volume. So what they, the animals do is they try to force that air out. And they do it in horses uh, with their abdominal musculature and over time you can actually see hypertrophy of the muscle uh, because of this continuous respiratory effort to push air out of their lungs. And that hypertrophy alone there is called a heave line. Okay. <clears throat> so what you do is, is you've got this horse with heaves, you give him a test dose of atropine and if he's responsive, that will diminish in severity. It gets a lot easier for him to breathe and that heave line becomes much less conspicuous. All right, so that would be a positive response and indicates he is a good candidate to use other bronchodilators in. All right. Now, uh, <coughs> uh, the primary side effect of atropine is ileus. Uh, horses are really prone to it, so that's the one drawback. And that's why I got to thinking about the buscopan as a possibility uh, because it's less risky in horses in terms of ileus. Now, <coughs> this same concept, not as a diagnostic test, but um, atropine and related compounds have been used by horse traders to sell horses with COPD to unsuspecting uh, uh, purchasers. Uh, <clears throat> they'll get atropine or there used to be a product called Bell's Drops, Dr. Bell's Drops. Um, it was one of those unapproved drugs that you could get. It was a belladonna alkaloid is, is why it was called Bell Drops. And belladonna is one of the plants that atropine is uh, obtained from in, in natural conditions. And they would give these horses Bell's Drops um, before a prospective owner came around and the horse seemed fine while the owner or uh, prospective buyer was there and they'd go ahead and buy the horse and then later that day when things wore off all of a sudden the horse they got had heaves. Uh, <clears throat> so um, even today it's a good idea when you're doing pre-purchase exams to check the pupil of uh, the horse to make sure it's not dilated and under some sort of parasympatholytic control. All right. So. Parasympatholytics work, but with the exception of the challenge test, they're not used very commonly because of their side effects. Uh, one last point about bronchodilators. <coughs> uh, what effect do glucocorticoids have in bronchodilation? And uh, this has to do with chronic use of beta-2 agonists. If, uh, <coughs> in human medicine, it's really well documented that chronic use of beta-2s causes down regulation of the beta-2 receptor. 
so people become less and less responsive to the bronchodilator. And uh, glucocorticoids resensitize those adrenergic receptors, so they make them responsive again. So it's very common <coughs> uh, to include a steroid either systemically or by inhalation to maintain reactivity of the beta-2 receptor. Okay. Um, mostly done in human medicine, but it's also a factor in cats. Cats are oftentimes on long-term glucocorticoids along with their bronchodilator. Okay, less common in horses because of the risk of laminitis. Glucocorticoids will be used short term in COPD uh, when there are exacerbations of the disease, uh, particularly after an allergen exposure, like they're moved from pasture into the stall where there's a lot of dust, they'll have uh, exacerbations of their COPD. And short term dexamethasone or prednisolone is used uh, to control that but typically not long-term like we do in the cat. 